One of my proudest accomplishments, professional accomplishments, is this streak, the streak of uninterrupted Parsha podcasts. Uh, Parsha's Re'e, four years ago, we began a streak of not missing a single week. And now it's uh, Parsha's Balak. So Pinchos, Pinchas Matos Mase, Dvar and Vashana Ekev Re'e in like five, six, seven weeks. It's going to be four years of not missing a single, a single Parsha podcast. And I'm always hyper alert and vigilant when the streak is in jeopardy. So this week, my wife is in Israel and she's coming back on Tuesday. But then on, on Wednesday, my nephew Dovi, he's getting married in Montreal. So we're in Toronto now. And on Tuesday, we're going to drive to Montreal rendezvous with my wife and we'll be there for the for the wedding on Wednesday, please God. Now, I typically release the Parsha podcast on Wednesday evening and I'm looking ahead at the week and I say it's going to be really rough to get the Parsha podcast done. I'm watching the kids myself. The kid, the other older kids help a little bit, but nothing's guaranteed. So I decided to do something a bit different. I decided to dedicate the Sunday class to the Parsha podcast to kind of have it uh, in the bank at the beginning of the week, just to make sure that we don't, we don't, God forbid, uh, miss a week. Uh, and with the help of the Almighty, I can say that some of the ideas that we're going to share today, they really are a fulfillment of the mandate of year eight of the Parsha podcast to go deep and deeper. Some of the most interesting and powerful and profound ideas yet. So I'm very excited for this special Sunday edition of the Parsha podcast. So let us begin. This week is Parsha's Balak, and it is a very unique Parsha, given that it's told, the whole story, the whole narrative is told from the point of view of our enemies. The Jewish people are ascendant. They are a juggernaut. They just roundly defeated, in the previous Parsha, the fearsome nations of Sichon and Og, and now the nation of Moab is quivering in fear, quaking in their boots from the Jewish nation. They're next on the chopping block. They are afraid, and they resort to unconventional warfare. And the parsha begins that Balak, who is the king of Moab, he tries to commission Bilam, the greatest sorcerer of all time, to come and curse the Jewish people. And he sends a delegation of dignitaries to go hire him, to go employ him. And there's a whole back and forth. Bilam tells him, well, well, I can't do it if God doesn't want. I have to consult with God. And God says, well, you can't go curse the Jewish people. They're, after all, they're blessed. And Bilam, who's so consumed with his own dignity and prestige and power, he interprets this as, God saying, no, you can't go with them because it's it's lower level dignitaries. They have to have an even more prestigious delegation of the highest ranking dignitaries. Only then can you go. So Balak sends a second delegation and Bilam is really pining to go curse the Jewish people. He's so consumed with hatred of this nation and God allows him to go. And the Talmud tells us, that this is the canonical episode, example, of an idea that God ultimately lets people do what they want to do. In the path that a person wants to tread, in a path the person wants to go upon, God will allow them. Bilam, he wanted to go curse the Jewish people. God told him no. And he's insisting, he's persistent He is not yielding. And God says, okay, you want to do that? You want to undertake this journey? Go. And he begins to travel. The parasha continues. And it's quite an eventful journey. It begins that he saddles his own donkey. He's the greatest sorcerer of all time. But he's so gleefully, so eager to go curse the Jewish nation, he does it himself. And the Almighty sends an angel to stop him. An angel of mercy. 
is stationed in his path to try to thwart him. And this very strange and interesting narrative continues. Bilam is on the donkey. And the donkey sees the angel brandishing a sword. And Bilam is oblivious to the presence of the angel. But the donkey, terrified, is veering off the course, goes off the road into the field. And Bill doesn't know what's happening, so he begins to hit the donkey to bring it back onto the path. But the angel repositions himself in a, a narrow path of grapevines, and there's a wall on either side. And the donkey sees the angel, and he he pivots to the side, and he jams Billam's leg into the wall. And Billam hits the donkey further. And again, the angel repositions in a very narrow path. There's no room to maneuver. And again, the the donkey sees the angel and begins to crouch. And Billam, in a fit of rage, strikes the donkey a third time with a stick. Now you read this. And it's a very detailed narrative of Bilam, the sorcerer of the nations, on the path, on the road to go curse the Jewish people. And there's lots of symbolism going on over here. And it's, it's, it's a very strange narrative. And of course, all the commentaries try to reveal some of the layers of insight behind every step of this interaction. But then it gets even stranger. The donkey begins to converse with Bilam. Chapter 22, verse 28. Hashem es piyason. God opened up the mouth of the donkey. Vatomer le Bilam. And she starts talking to Bilam. Why are you hitting me these three times? And Bilam is totally nonplussed. And he responds, he responds to the donkey, because you're mocking me. That's why I'm hitting you. If I only had a sword, I'd, I'd kill you. And the donkey responds back, well, I've been a trusty donkey ever since you were a little kid. Did I ever behave in this fashion? We'll hold back and forth. A dialogue between Bilam, trying to go curse the Jewish nation, and his donkey. And finally, verse 31, God uncovered the eyes of Bilam, and he sees the sword-bearing angel that his donkey had seen Previously. And then we read a conversation between Bilam and the angel. And the the angel tells Bilam, why'd you hit the donkey? A whole back and forth. Very fascinating and very strange, very peculiar events that were told about Bilam's trip to go rendezvous with with Balak to try to curse the Jewish people. Finally, in verse 27, Balak and, and Bilam meet, and they begin a series of attempted curses of the Jewish nation. Now, the Talmud tells us something very interesting. Bilam, he was a prophet of sorts, he was a great sorcerer, and he had a particular cursing ability. And this is a very interesting idea, a very strange idea. He knew how to pinpoint the fleeting moment of divine rage. Every day, the Talmud tells us, the Almighty gets angry for but a fleeting moment. And at that precise time, any curse that's unleashed will land with devastating effect. And Bilam's specialty was to know how to pinpoint that precise moment. And he would channel that, uh, that opportunity to curse whoever he didn't like. And the Talmud continues that for the duration of Bilam's journey, his, his odyssey, if you will, to go curse the Jewish people, we don't know how long it was, but we do know that it was it was a whole journey to get there. And then he went to one mountain, brought a bunch of sacrifices, went to a second mountain, a third mountain, ultimately blessed the Jewish people four times before leaving. 
But for the duration of the Bilam episode, the Almighty, the Talmud tells us, suspended the typical daily divine moment of rage. And the Talmud says that this was a tremendous gift of God. Because what would have happened had the Almighty had this moment of rage, as he typically does during the time when Bilaam was trying to curse the Jewish people? The Talmud tells us, had God gotten angry for that moment during the time of Bilaam's attempted malediction, the whole nation would have been destroyed. There would have, wouldn't have been even a single survivor, a single, a single refugee. And that's why Bilaam was unsuccessful. And Rashi actually points this out in chapter 23, verse 8, after Bilaam's unsuccessful. He's trying to curse. He's not able to do it. He's forced to bless. He says, how can I curse when God is not cursing? How can I be angry, be filled with rage if God is not filled with rage? He didn't really know how to curse himself. He was able to channel this moment, whatever that means, of divine rage. So he tries it from one angle, from one vantage point. He's forced to bless the nation in the most effusive and poetic way. And Balak, who hired him, is very disappointed. I hired you to curse them, not to bless them. So they try a different angle. And again, instead of cursing, he gives an incredible string of praises, of blessings for the nation. Such wonderful blessings that the Talmud actually says that the sages considered incorporating Bilaam's blessings into the, into the Shema. We have the Shema, which is three paragraphs from the Torah that we recite a minimum of twice a day. And then we're going to add more paragraphs. Which paragraphs? The, the episode of Bilaam. But the Talmud says it was ultimately shelved because it would make the Shema too long. So for the sake of brevity, they kept it at three paragraphs. But on a, a substance level, these praises, these blessings are worthy of being incorporated into the daily Pledge of Allegiance, if you will, the daily Shema, and being read twice a day. So Bill tried to curse. Ultimately, he blesses the people four times and is forced to leave in disgrace and ignominy. Now, if that's where the parsha ended... It would be an unvarnished success. It would have been a spectacular success. But that's not where it ends. At the very end of the parsha, Bilaam makes a recommendation. He makes a recommendation that causes a lot of damage. Chapter 25, the people are in a place called Shittim, and they begin to sin with the Moabite women. The Moabite women begin to seduce the Jewish men. And Rashi tells us, Rashi points us out even earlier, the Talmud elaborates, and it's it's clear if you study all the sources. This is based upon Bilaam's advice. He says, listen, I'm, I'm trying to destroy the people. You want to destroy the people. I want to destroy the people. They have a protective Kevlar. You cannot... Curse them. But we could find a workaround. If you get your Moabite girls to seduce the Jewish men, that will lead to their destruction. Rashi tells us very famously that Bilaam tells Balak, Bilaam the sorcerer tells Balak, the king of, of Moab, he tells him, the God of these, the Jewish God, he hates promiscuity. He hates immorality, and he's protecting them. But he will protect them if you get them to behave in a promiscuous fashion. So the Moabites, they release their their girls, they seduce the men, and then a plague happens, and 24,000 die, and it's a, it's a total disaster. Not only do the Jewish men commit immoral 
themes with the Moabite girls, but they get the Jewish men to actually worship the Moabite idols. They ate and they bowed to their gods. And they cleaved to Baal Peor. What is Baal Peor? This is again chapter 25, verse 3. Baal Peor is the idol of the Moabites, and it was the most execrable idol. Because the way it was worshipped is by defecating in front of it. And the Jewish people, this great nation, the witness Sinai, has motions, eating manna, protected by the clouds of glory. They began to cleave to the idol of Moab. And they suffer with a plague. And the parsha ends with a terrible calamity wherein the head of the tribe of Shimon, he begins to cohabit with a Midianite princess and then there's mayhem and people are crying and sobbing. It's a disaster. And amid all the chaos, Pinchas, Aaron's grandson, he makes a move and he steers the two in a fit of zealotry, ending the plague, but not before he claimed 24,000 lives. So the story of our parsha, Bill, I'm trying to, to curse the Jewish people. He's unsuccessful, but his recommendation to seduce the Jewish men, that causes a terrible blow to the people. That's the Parsha. Let's go a bit deeper into the story. We're going to share three different segments, if you will, to go deep and deeper into the Parsha. For starters, this Parsha, it's different than the rest of the Torah. The only way we know this story, it's only because it was revealed to us in prophecy. There's there's Bilam, and he is commissioned by Bala to go curse the Jewish people, and all the events that happen along the way, and all the blessings that he says, ultimately. All that, it happened in a way that the nation was not initially aware. The whole story happens to the to the nations. It's all happening behind the scenes for us. Yet the Torah tells us the whole story, obviously, via prophecy. The whole Torah is given to us via prophecy. But we don't typically hear the perspective of our enemies. I guess you can think of a few examples. You know, Pharaoh talking to his advisors we find in Exodus chapter 1. So you see some examples of it. But the whole Parsha, the whole narrative, the foiled attempt of of Bilm to curse the Jewish people, all of that, all of that's happening from the perspective of our enemies. And he tried and he, and he failed. And the question that we can pose is why do we need to be told what happened over here? The whole story could have been omitted and the nation would never have been the wiser. The Torah ded- dedicates a lot of time, a whole parsha, effectively. Lots of ink to tell us all the twists and turns of this narrative. So obviously, every part of it has some lesson for us, but on a meta level, why are we told this story? So there are a variety of suggestions that we can propose. For one, the Pesach Haggadah that we say on, on the Pesach Seder, it has a theme in it. One part of the, one part of the, the Haggadah that talks about how Pharaoh wasn't a unique once in history phenomenon. He's trying to destroy the Jewish nation, but it happens all the time. In fact, Bechal Dar Vadar, in every single generation, we recite every Pesach. They rise up to destroy us. There are forces, there are elements in every single generation that are plotting and scheming to try to destroy the Jewish nation, the nation of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But the Almighty, the Holy One, blessed is He, saves us 
from their plan. We're not aware of it because they're steaming and God's protecting us in a way that you know, we're, we're unaware, so to speak, of those bullets whizzing by us. The extent of the planning and the steaming and the plotting of our enemies is unknown to us, but the Almighty saves us. The shortest chapter in Tanakh is chapter 117 of Psalms. And it says, Hallelujah, Hashem, praise Hashem, call Goyim, all nations. Who praises Hashem? All nations praise Hashem. Shabachuhu, another word for praise. Call Haumim, all the peoples. So who's praising Hashem? The nations, the other peoples. Why? Ki gavar aleinu chasto. Because God's kindness is overwhelming upon us. So the Jewish nation are saying, they're going to praise, the other nations are going to praise God. They're going to herald God for his kindness on us. It's strange. Why are, why are they praising God for his kindness upon us? So the commentaries explain that the nations, they know the extent of the malevolent, devious plots that are being hatched upon us, and God is constantly foiling. And therefore, when they see more of God's kindness upon us than we do. Bilaam, he, he's, he's the most adept sorcerer in the world. And we're unaware. The nation's totally unaware of what's happening. They don't even know that this happened. It was revealed to them much later via prophecy. But Bilaam, he's trying whatever he could do to try to trust the Jewish people, and God's protect them. And when they see his mercy and his kindness upon the nation, they see the extent, so to speak, of his omnipotence and kindness, and they could praise God in ways that we can't. He loves us and protects us from unknown dangers. The nation is blissfully unaware of the grave mortal danger that they faced and the Almighty thwarted. And again, the Talmud tells us very clearly, had God gotten angry, as is typical for that fleeting moment of rage, the nation would have been finished. We were spared and we didn't even know about it. And this is something the Torah once they had across us, that there is this this, this this constant protective dome upon us that we're not even aware of. And this story is the best example of that. This is part of the lessons that Torah wants to incorporate and wants us to really absorb. Who knows how much danger God protects us from at all times? Of course, you know I know nothing about politics. But yesterday after Shabbos, I opened my phone and I saw, like all of y'all saw, the assassination attempt on, on President Trump. And the bullet was like a, an inch away, an inch away. Everyone saw the photos here. That's what's happening to our people all the time. But it doesn't even, doesn't even nick the air. There, there's bullets flying at us from all directions. In every single generation. And it doesn't even touch us. We're not aware of it. I think that's perhaps one lesson, a big lesson from this story. There's a second lesson, perhaps, that we can glean from the story. Bilaam is the epitome of evil. In chapter 5 of Perky Avos, he is contrasted with Abraham. Abraham is, is the greatest of all time, and we should all strive to be students of Abraham. And the exact opposite are the students of Bilaam. Abraham had all the wonderful qualities, all the possible positive traits. He had all of them. And Bilaam had the exact opposite, all the bad qualities incorporated into one person. But there's something that we have to learn from Bilaam. There's something remarkable about how Bilaam went around 
perpetrating his evil. Bilam was 100% dedicated to his craft. And it's a lesson from him for us. We have to learn to emulate his enthusiasm for evil in our righteousness. Bilam is committed to this. He wakes up early and he saddles his own donkey. And he matches, we're told. He matches Abraham's devotion. There's two people in the whole tower who saddled their own donkey. Woke up early, was saddled their own donkey. It's Abraham and it's, and it's Bilam. He's matching Abraham's devotion to do the most unconscionable thing in the world. And nothing stops him. Not the talking donkeys and not the sword brandishing angels. And he builds the seven altars and brings all the sacrifices and tries from this vantage point and that vantage point. Bilaam has unparalleled determination and resilience and devotion in evil. And we have to ask ourselves the question, perhaps, how dedicated are we to righteousness? I once... I once saw a video of Rabbi Noach Weinberg. He was the founder of Aish, the great yeshiva and organization and institution in Jerusalem. And he was in Auschwitz with some of his students. Now, Aish is, the the, the mission of Aish is to try to help save the Jewish people and to empower the Jewish nation. He says something unbelievable. He says, you see how organized and efficient and committed these Nazis were to their genocide. That's what we have to be in our efforts to save the people. I heard another story. One of the rabbis in Houston, very dedicated to his studies, finishes the whole Talmud every couple of years. This is the legend. The legend has it that he was once privy to a conversation between a a business person and some other person. Two people were talking. And the businessman was talking about how, how he thinks about his business and how he, he's so dedicated to it. He doesn't, I don't remember the details of the story, but he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't eat in the day until he takes care of all of his business dealings for that day. And the great rabbi says, if this person in his business is so dedicated, he's not going to eat before he takes care of his business dealings for the day. Why should we be any less? So this rabbi lives in Houston. He has a certain regimen of daily Talmud study. And he doesn't eat any day before he finishes that. Now, of course, I'm not comparing business to what Billam's doing, or God forbid the, 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 the Nazis are doing, but the concept. When we see other people who are so committed to things that are not as important as, as what we're doing, we should try to match their enthusiasm, at least, or even surpass their enthusiasm. If you believe that you're trying to stand up for what the Almighty wants, and you're an ambassador of God in the world, and you're, you're, you're God's emissary in the world, if you're serious about that, your enthusiasm should match that of Bilaam. I read an, an amazing story. In Israel, socialized medicine, you know, so they have they actually have three separate patients in every hospital room, and they have like a little thin sheet separating the two, separating the, uh, the various patients. In America, they give you a whole suite, a whole suite uh, by yourself. I remember we, you know, three of our children were born in Israel. They have three different women who just gave birth in the same room. It's it's outrageous. Eh, not outrageous. It's great because it's more efficient. But anyhow, it leads for some very uh, interesting clashes, you know, of different uh, cultures and societies. I remember once my wife was, uh, after having a baby, there was an Arab woman sharing the same room. And the Arab man, I guess I guess she had recently had a baby, 
he came to me and he's like, are you staying here overnight? Because Islamic law would not allow uh, a foreign man to be with uh, in the same room as, as his wife. So I assured him that he's all right. I remember when I was in the hospital with my grandfather, a blessed memory, the, a couple of days before he passed. So my grandfather was in and out of consciousness, but he, he was always wearing a, he was wearing a, a hearing aid. And I guess the battery was low. So it was making this very shrilly sound. And there was a, <laughs> there was another person sharing the room who was going nuts from that shrilling sound, but he was uh, bedridden and couldn't do anything about it. But he was screaming and cursing from the other, from the other, past the little sheet, past the partition. But anyhow, I read the story that there was a, a, a great rabbi in an Israeli hospital and he's in the same room as some other dude. And this patient, he wakes up from his uh, anesthesia or wakes up from his coma and his son is there and he's like, the first thing he says when he gets out of the coma or gets, you know, wakes up is, what was the score? What was the final score in the game? And the rabbi says, you know, when we wake up, do we think about, you know, what does the Talmud say? What's the halacha? Are we so engaged in our pursuit of the Almighty's Torah and his wisdom and, and the mission that we're entrusted with as they are in the sports and all the other nonsense that people can consume their lives with? We have a story here. Bilam, it's, it's an exemplary portrait of dedication, of determination, of evil. Yes. But if he can be so committed and devoted to his craft, we ought to mimic his enthusiasm for ours. You see people, and I'm I'm definitely guilty of this, I'm not trying to cast aspersions here, but they come to shul, come to daven, and they're five minutes late, ten minutes late, half hour late, leave a little early, chatting with their friends on the side, but if they were to go to the movies or go to the game, they get there two hours early, got a tailgate ahead of time and got to stay late and all that. And you ask the question, you know, you're coming to talk to the Almighty. Shouldn't you at least accord that the same amount of, of respect and punctuality as going to the game? And again, I'm guilty of this. I'm not pointing fingers. But that's what we could learn from Bilam. Perhaps. Perhaps that's why we're told the whole story of Bilam, because his enthusiasm should be a lesson and hopefully not an indictment for us. Let's go to the next segment of this week's Parsha podcast. Bilam, on the way, has a conversation with his donkey. One of the most memorable episodes in the Torah. The angel's there with the sword. The donkey sees the angel. He beats up his donkey. And then the donkey talks to him. And once you read this, you can't quite forget it. This this prophet, this sorcerer who's traveling to go curse the Jewish people, has a conversation with his donkey. Now, nothing in the Torah is told just for kicks, right? There's always a lesson for us in we could ask the question, you know, what is the lesson for us in this very unusual conversation? I saw an amazing piece in the writings of Rabbi Rucham Levavitz. I read it a few weeks ago. And it made me so happy to read this piece that when I traveled to, to upstate New York, we drove and then I drove to Canada the car is full to the gills. I always have to bring some of my books with me. I got to bring a little library with me. I brought three of his books with me for our summer drive because I was so taken by this piece that I read. This essay on the talking donkey. Is this a miracle or is this a miracle? There's never been another instance of a talking donkey. We have the parrots. We have that famous uh, fish. But this is a miracle. First and only time it's ever happened. 
But let's kind of sharpen our analysis. Where, where exactly is the miracle? Where is this departure from nature? So all of us would say, well, donkeys don't talk and here are the donkeys talking. And again, I'm not much of an expert in politics or animals or animal husbandry. I'm not much of a farmhand. But from what I gather, this is not typical. Not typical donkey behavior. So we have a miracle that the donkey is having a conversation with Bilaam. That's what every one of us would have said. But if you read the verse, the verse says something else. The verse does not highlight the miracle of the donkey speaking, rather of God opening its mouth. God opened its mouth, but the donkey spoke on its own. Chapter 22, verse 28. Hashem espiyason. God opened the mouth of the donkey. Vatomer lebilam, and she said to Bilam. God's intervention here is only in the opening of the mouth. But the speech came from the animal itself. That's a very sharp reading of the verse. But what Rabbi Rucham says, he says the donkey always had the ability to speak. It just didn't have a mouth. The ability to speak was always present, but there was a gatekeeper. The mouth was sealed. And all God did was remove the gatekeeper, open the mouth, and the donkey spoke. And he expands on this idea. He talks about the ubiquitous classification system in Torah literature. This is a very ancient system. It's actually featured in, in many ancient non-Jewish sources. There's the domain, so meach chai medaber. There's the inanimate, like the rocks and the dirt. And that's like the lowest level of creation. And there's a class up. And that's a tzomech, a, a, a plant, plant life, anything that sprouts. And then there's a level up, which is the chai, those things that are living, like all the animals. And then there's the highest class, so to speak, of creation, at least in our world. And that's the medaber, the speaker, the human. Human's not just an intelligent ape. It's a different class of creation. And Rabbi Ruchim observes, he says, I saw a sapling growing out of a rock. And we know that animals, they eat plants and the plants become assimilated within them. So if you have a plant, animal eats it, now that plant is part of the animal. So that level two, now you suddenly have a level two becoming level three. And here the animal is a speaker. Level three becomes level four. So Baruchim says, this is how we ought to understand the different classes. Domain, the inanimate, the dirt, the dust, the rocks, and the tzomeach, the, the plants and the things that grow, and the chai, the living things, and the madaba, the speaker. When God created these things, he eliminated them. He put gatekeepers, if you will. So the in, in, inanimate things, they cannot grow because they're inanimate. And they're fenced in. But God could remove the fence. God could expand its realm of existence. So dirt can become a sapling. A rock can have something growing out of it. And the sprouts, they can come alive. They can kind of upgrade. And the animals can talk. And he cites a verse, Psalms 96, verse 12. Oz yiranenu. Kralatzeyar. Then in the future, the trees of the forest will shout for joy. The trees, level two, saplings, things that grow, will scream out and yelp for joy. 
God removes the gatekeeper, the tree can suddenly shout. The donkey's mouth, once it's opened, it could speak. Similarly, the donkey is witnessing the angel, and Bilaam is oblivious to it until God uncovers its his eyes. Verse 31, God removes the cover from Bilaam's eyes and he sees, he sees the angel. The vision of the angel is not the miracle. The removal of the gatekeeper is the miracle. That's the observation of Rabbi Rucham. And then he says like this. Everything is like this. Everything is like this. Way back in in the book of Genesis, Abraham is traveling with his two lads, together with Isaac, and they go to the mountain. And if you read, this is, of course, the episode of the binding of Isaac. And Rashi cites the Midrash. They get to the mountain. They see Mount Moriah. And they see a special divine cloud hovering over the mountain. And Abraham asks his traveling mates, do you see what I see? And Isaac says, yes, I see the cloud. And the other two, which we're told, Rashi tells us, is Ishmael and Eliezer. They say, we don't see it. We have no idea what you're talking about. So what does Abraham tell them? Stay here with the donkey. You guys are on the same level as the donkey. Because we are witnessing a different dimension. We see the spiritual cloud hovering over the mountain. You don't. You're kind of on a lower level. They're all humans. But some humans have these restrictions. Abraham and Isaac have transcended those restrictions. What's above the speaker? What's above all humans? That's the angels, right? What happens when someone becomes a prophet? They're conversing with the angels. They have transcended their limited existence. And they've now upgraded. They're above humans. They're a different class. A prophet is a completely different class of a human. More of an angel than a human. And he ends off by by giving us a very powerful insight. All of us have incredible, incredible greatness baked within us. It's just concealed. It's limited. There are gatekeepers. We have stones, he tells us. We have inanimate objects, so to speak. We have qualities within us that seem to never be in any conceivable future, be capable of bearing fruit. They're duds. But there's a way to change that. The stones can yield water. The stones can yield sprouts. This made me think of what we discussed last week. Last week we talked about a, a midrash. The midrash says that a stone, well, that's representative of Torah. A stone's also representative of the Yitzhara. Well, which is it? Maybe there was a process by which a stone can ascend the ladder. You think of the lowest rung, and that's the inanimate objects, and then the tzomeach, the the things that grow, and then the things that are alive, and then the human, and then the angels. And what's above the angels? That's the Torah. The stone can be all the way in the bottom. It can also be all the way in the top. The potential is baked into everything to have transcendental greatness. Yes, by default, they're all limited, but they don't need to remain limited. Our flaws, our limitations can be made to sprout. All God did to the donkey, just remove that little little limitation. All its ability to be like a human at least momentarily, was just the limitation that was removed. All of us can become angelic. 
We just have to kind of crack the code of unlocking, so to speak, our mouth, of, of removing that little limitation, but it's all there, ready baked in to begin with. And finally, the third segment of analysis of our parsha. After Bilaam's four blessings, he tried to curse the nation, he failed. He offers advice that proves deadly. Chapter 25, verse 1, the Israelites, they're in Shittim, and they begin to cohabit with the girls of Moab. This is the advice of Bilaam. And what does he say? So Rashi, in 2414, cites the Talmud. The words that he says are, the God of these, i.e. the God of the Jews, hates promiscuity. And if you want to kind of separate them, the Jews are protected. God's protecting them. If you want to create a wedge between them and God, get them to behave in a promiscuous fashion. They behave in that way, God hates it, and then he's going to allow them to be vulnerable and to be destroyed. That was his suggestion, and the Moabites, they they bought in. And they allowed their girls, or they encouraged their girls to go seduce the Jewish men. And what happened? The, the men were taken by the Moabite women. And then they got them to do idolatry. And they ate, verse 2 of chapter 25. And they bowed to their deities. And they cleaved to Baal Por, that idol of the Moabites. And that caused a terrible plague. Rashi tells us that really two things are happening over here. The Moabite women are seducing the men, but once they're in a fit of passion, the Moabite women would pull out their idols and say, bow to it. And they would capitulate. I will point out also interesting in verse 2, it says that the Moabite women, the girls, they called the Jewish men to go worship their gods. And they ate, and they bowed to their deities. And the fact that they ate seems to be a bit out of play. Like, what's the significance of that? And it's quite obvious, if you understand the method of worship of this idol, you need to eat. Jewish people eat manna. A full manna diet does not produce any excrement. So this idol, the way it was worshipped, it was by defecating before it, they had to eat. So they called the Jewish men to go serve their gods. They fed them and then they cleaved to Baal Pa'or and that resulted in a plague. And it all got started by the suggestion of Bilaam, his advice, his recommendation to Balak, the god of this nation, hates promiscuity. And we can ask a few questions. There are a lot of sins that you imagine God doesn't like. Everything that's a sin, it's something which is a violation of the will of God. To steal, to lie, to violate the Shabbos, to eat non-kosher food. There's a lot of things that are a violation of the will of, of God. But promiscuity that is singled out as something that he that he hates. Why is sexual impropriety so uniquely reviled by God that that's how you create this wedge between the nation and the Almighty? Furthermore, if you read what happened over here, first three verses of chapter 25, Bilm has a, has a plot, as a scheme, and the Moabite women are eager to play their part. They seduce the men, and then they throw in a dash of idolatry. If Bilm understood that the way to make the nation vulnerable is via promiscuity, then just get the promiscuity. Why is he throwing in the idolatry as well? His whole suggestion, get the Jewish men to behave in an immoral fashion. God hates them. God hates that. And then he'll, he'll remove his protection. 
But in the middle, there's also this idolatry. So I want to share with you a deep idea that I heard from, from Rabbi Berkowitz. Rashi explains in verse 2 that the men were seduced by the Moabite women. And then when they were, their, their passions were aroused and, and the, their Yetzara was really active, the Moabite women pulled out their idols and said, bow to it. And they did. So it's a very interesting process here. When the men were under the spell of their desires, they began doing things that were unimaginable otherwise. Think about how insane this, this form of idolatry is. Baal Pa'ar. It's like the, the most devious, the craziest sort of idolatry that we can fathom. And why they do it? Because they were aroused for the promiscuity, for the immorality. The reason why God despises promiscuity more than anything else, because that amounts to a discarding of the intellect. It breeds insanity. Someone's brain just stops working. And all intellect gets discarded. And that's why God hates it so much. Not because it's a worse a worse sin per se than idolatry. They're both terrible sins, of course. But it is an abrogation of our humanity, our intellect. These people, what were they eating all? They were eating manna for 40 years. They're they're surrounded by constant miracles. The idea that these people would worship idolatry and the idolatry of Baal Pa'ar out of conviction, it's outrageous. There's no way that they would do it. But this is a manifestation of why God hates this particular sin. Because it it destroys the brain. It destroys clear thinking. And this was the secret that Bill knew. This is what he was trying to suggest. You could find a way to take this, this prideful nation, this proud people, this resolute nation, this illustrious people, these descendants of Abram, Abram Isaac, and Jacob, the ones who witnessed the Exodus and the sign of Revelation, eating manna, studying by Moshe's feet for 40 years. And you could turn them into powder and get them to give up everything. They can behave as utter fools with no logic, with no brains, with no reason, with no clear-headed thinking. And that's what God despises more than anything else. Our intellect is our capacity to connect to the Almighty. It's our greatest power. It's what makes us special and, and unique and capable of greatness. It's the human of the human. And when a human discards that, throws that out, that's the ultimate repudiation of their humanity. How many stories do we know? It's an infinite amount of instances where people gave up everything. Their families, their livelihoods, their reputation, everything. Because of this Yetzirah. It happens every day. And there's no way to rationalize it. How many divorces happened this week because of people having affairs? And How many divorces? Probably 10,000? People losing their whole lives, their kids, half their money, and end up living a life of misery. Why? Because, because of what? A little bit of carnal pleasure? Was it really worth it? No operational, functional brain would say it is. But they do it nonetheless. Do you know why? Because that's what this Yetzirah does. It decouples a person from their intellect. 
from their brains. And our brains are our superpowers. And we must do whatever we can to guard them. And that's maybe another takeaway from Bilam. This is why it's so imperative to make sure that we create boundaries in this area. And we don't capitulate to our Yetzirah in, in this area. Because if we have anything, it's only due to our intellect and our brains. And once we give that up, we're giving up everything. And that... It's a shame, and that's something which God despises. A human mind is a terrible thing to waste. And it's revilesome in the eyes of the Almighty. Pound for pound, is it a worse, the worst in the world? No, not necessarily. But it is the ability for a human to stop living as a human and to start living as some impulsive being, some person dominated by animalistic instincts. May we all be fortunate to retain our intellect, to retain our humanity, and to not be drawn in the ways of the Eight Sahara. May we learn the lessons of Bilam. Bilam is one of the worst villains, but we have some, something to learn from him. We have to learn about how dedicated we ought to be in our pursuit of our of our righteous goals. And we have to always remember, donkey had the ability to upgrade. And if the donkey could become a speaker, we can become angels. There's just a little bit we have to work to unlock it, to crack it open, to open up our mouth. I appreciate your listenership. For this uh, special Sunday edition of the Parsha Podcast, this was a delight. I really enjoyed it. I hope you did as well. Maybe 10% as, as much as I enjoyed it. I look forward to your questions and comments and your feedback. Of course, the email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com. I look forward to continuing to study with y'all over the course of the summer. And please, God, continuing the Parsha podcast week after week. And again, the email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com.